Thank you for joining our event, Standing with Ukraine, Strengthening Crisis Support. My name is Heather Conley. I'm president of GMF. We are delighted to co-host this event with our long-standing partner, the Reanimation Package of Reforms Coalition, a very important part of the GMF's, GMF's work in the Black Sea region. Please note that today's program is also uh, has translation services available in the Ukrainian language. We have an extraordinary conversation planned today with distinguished colleagues who are laser focused and on the front lines of this growing humanitarian crisis in and around Ukraine from Russia's unprovoked war. And we are particularly pleased to start this conversation with a very important voice who just recently returned from Poland, USAID uh, Administrator, um, Ambassador Samantha Power. As of last evening, UNHCR reports an exodus of over 1 million refugees in just seven days, 600,000 in Poland, 250,000 in Romania, over 100,000 in Moldova, Slovakia and Hungary are also receiving refugees. The United States has announced a $54 million uh, assistance package, and there appears to be an additional over $10 billion request, some of that for Ukraine's humanitarian needs. But these are numbers. And I think it's important to make sure we understand the human voice. A GMF staff member has a family member in Kharkiv, and this is what this individual writes. There is a famine in Kharkiv. Thousands of ads are, are going up asking for something to eat. Children without parents, disabled people in a very difficult situation. In the city, we have very little food. If this all lasts longer than a month, civilians will begin to die of hunger and disease. But we are holding on. We do not have panic and despondency. This is the main thing. Live and thank God. Ambassador Power, in your uh, very distinguished professional career, you've seen humanitarian crises from every angle, as a war correspondent, as a scholar, as a UN uh, ambas ambassador. And I know you have watched this uh, crisis unfold on the front lines in Poland. You've described it as harrowing. I would love an update from you of what you're seeing this situation and how the US is planning to respond. We thank you and we welcome you for being with us today. Thank you so much. And, and uh, thanks to the, all the people who've joined uh, the turnout for this event, like the turnout for the people of Ukraine uh, around the world has just been overwhelming. And maybe, maybe we'll have a chance a little bit later also to talk about what happened at the UN yesterday, uh, which is really quite striking. Um, I did wanna say just before we, we start, and of course I'll, I'll respond to your question as best I can, um, that we actually have uh, two Ukrainians joining us as well in this discussion. So I wanna make sure uh, you know, while I can offer my reflections, uh, there's nothing like hearing, as you, you just indicated as well, uh, quoting your colleague uh, but, and, and, and their family member, I, th I think it's really important to hear from, from folks on the ground directly, because my, my perspective is a patch on the elephant, surely, at best. Um, so uh, I did travel as quickly as I could to the Ukrainian-Polish border and uh, you know, we've been planning uh, for around a number of scenarios uh, for many months, prepositioning stockpiles, getting the organization, the World Food Program, which had been active in Ukraine back when the conflict broke out in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine, but then had gotten out about three years ago, getting them to reestablish a presence there, knowing uh, that a conflict, unfortunately, was likely that a Russian invasion was likely. And so a part of what I was up to was, was checking in with our DART team. We have a team of 40 people who are these kind of crack emergency responders that help coordinate among the various agencies. Uh, the, the flow of goods and people um, uh, you know, across uh, border crossings along the frontline states. So each of the, the countries that border Ukraine of course, has a has a critical role uh, to play, um, and so on the Polish side, I can tell you what I saw, which is really unusual: just all women and children, um, and that is really still the case today. Now, that's partly again because of what everybody is familiar with, which is uh, a policy uh, on the part of the Ukrainian government to keep men of fighting age uh, in Ukraine but it is also reflective uh, by and large of the will of the people to stay and, and, and to fight for their country and their independence. 
So, you know, you can imagine what it was like for, for mothers to have parted with their husbands or, or children with their fathers. Um, it was just the emotion. And you've seen this, there's been a fair amount, I think, of television coverage of people coming across and interviewing them and hearing, um, you know, just what it was like to say goodbye and, and to not know what the future, what the future held. Uh, the other dimension of it is, um, you know, not really knowing uh, what Putin's plans are beyond what he is doing right now. So, uh, you know, some people came over but left family in Western Ukraine uh, in towns like Lviv. And yet there's a lot of anxiety about uh, what Putin's intentions are beyond what he is doing now, unless his calculation can be changed or unless the people around him uh, activate uh, much more than they have to this point. Um, what I will say is you mentioned a million, the figure of a million. Uh, when I was there, which was just three days ago, it was I think 360,000 was the, the figure. So it just gives you a sense of the scale of flow and that is accelerating every day. And if some of the towns that the Russians are now besieging, like Kharkiv, if it becomes possible for civilians to be evacuated, which is something all the humanitarians are working on right now and the Ukrainians really wanna make happen, uh, then you can imagine that those numbers are gonna uh, go up even more. And what I will say is just commend the, the neighboring states um, for, uh, other than Belarus, <laughs> for, uh, opening their borders and and welcoming people with these grave needs. I mean, it's it's just there there are very few questions being asked. People's names are being taken. They're being registered uh, to come into European Union countries. But even Moldova, which isn't in the European Union and had not expected to be a major uh, source of of refugees or a major recipient of refugees. They've already taken, must be by today, more than 100,000, and they had expected anybody who came through Moldova to move on uh, to Germany and, or, or elsewhere in Europe, and yet about half the people going to Moldova are actually choosing to stay. And again, hoping that this thing uh, will resolve itself, that the war will end, and that they'll, you know, by staying close, they'd be able to go back to their homes, because no one wants to leave their homes. So that generosity is noteworthy. There have been incidents, of course, where third country nationals have faced uh, harassment or been pushed to the back of the line. And I think it's really important that the Polish government, the Ukrainian government, everybody has come out condemning that. And I, I think for all the chaos of the first few days, there's a much more orderly process now. And, and hopefully we will see no more of those, those incidents. And I will note, of course, that um, any incident is a, is a terrible incident and something to be deplored, uh, but you also see you know, the Russian Federation disinformation machine uh, making it seem like this is, um, you know, uh, a, a very, very widespread uh, phenomenon and that this indicates, you know, the, the, uh, the Nazism of, of, the, of the government and so forth. And I just, I can tell you that from the minute we first heard those reports, the response from the Ukra Ukrainian authorities was, was instant in terms of getting those instructions out to border guards, getting it into the chain of command, of course, uh, you know, as, is very important as well. So maybe I can leave it there because I know you have a, a, a lot of other questions, but let's say one other thing, which is our emphasis as, as a US government working uh, through our UN partners and the ICRC and others is uh, you know, to continue to, to smooth the process by which people can leave the country to make sure that the frontline states, this is uh, the State Department's uh, Population, Refugees and Migration Bureau does great work in this, make working with UNHCR, but mainly the governments in the region uh, to make sure that, that there is a welcome there, not only hot meals, you know, when they first arrive, but, but an onward, you know, a place to spend the night, drawing on diaspora networks, uh, drawing on the outpouring that we've seen all around the world. And, and again, it's, it was very inspiring to see uh, you know, citizens from, and, and I've read about some of them, I saw some of it, but just becoming kind of amateur Uber drivers, free Uber drivers, just deciding suddenly to become uh, de facto taxi drivers, going to the border, asking people where they wanted to go, whether they could help. And we can just only hope as the flow increases, as it might, uh, that that generosity persists. But as the Kharkiv testimonial that you offered indicates, uh, the, the, the burning humanitarian needs uh, are inside Ukraine. And getting uh, food into dangerous areas, into violent areas is very challenging. We have the World Food Program rolling its trucks now. 
across the border stockpiles being amassed and using train networks, road networks, uh, everything we can. And then again, um, ensuring that, that access is granted. The big issue of modern conflict, as you know, in places like Syria, Yemen, elsewhere, is at, and Ethiopia uh, most dramatically, is access. It's just, you know, uh, authorities deny those who have a monopoly on violence in a particular area or have an, a military advantage denying humanitarian access. And so that cannot happen in this instance. And the UN uh, is very, very focused on making sure that it can negotiate access to be able to evacuate civilians from those towns that are under siege and to be able to flow in humanitarian assistance uh, and medical supplies along the lines of, of, of uh, again, the, what is needed, um, not only in Kharkiv, but in Mariupol, in Kyiv, uh, and in, in cities that are under siege in this grotesque uh, and unjustified um, invasion of Ukraine. Ambassador Power, thank you so much. And I want to drill down right where you left it, is, is there is an extraordinary urgency to create these so-called green humanitarian corridors. We know the assistance is you know, arriving on the, the Polish border. Um, can you, again, provide us as much detail as possible what the U.S. government is going to be doing and proposing to make sure these humanitarian corridors are up and that those vital supplies are going in? This, the, the fact that these cities are now uh, being encircled and, and under siege, how do, we get, how do we get the aid into the most affected populations? Well, I will come back to this question, but but let me just um, t take a moment to, to which I it previewed that I would um, for reasons you'll understand. Uh, take a moment to come back to what happened yesterday at the UN, which may seem like a, a side issue, but I actually think is relevant. So the vote was 141 to five um, when I was UN ambassador. Um, I uh, helped shepherd worked with the Ukrainians to shepherd a vote on the invasion of Crimea. Um, it was one of the most sort of effective operations that I've been associated with because even though if you're not tracking the UN every day, you wouldn't pay that much attention to this maybe, but countries are usually not that enthusiastic about standing up uh, to uh, one of the major powers or you know, a very powerful country like Russia, a veto holder. And so back then to get a hundred votes, um, you know, uh, in a sense, condemning what the Russians were doing and rejecting the results of this fake referendum that they did in Crimea. That was major. I mean, it was well beyond what anybody would have considered possible at the time. Um, 141 yesterday, the fact that you saw not only China abstain as they had done in the Security Council, but Cuba and Venezuela abstaining, not joining with Russia, the fact that you saw the entire uh, Gulf Cooperation Council, the entire GCC country, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and others who usually, again, tend to abstain on country-specific measures within the UN, um, really is a sea change. And it's and you see it now just reading about, uh, you know, uh, Russian airlines being pulled out of whatever the global airline network is and unable to fly. I mean, just just every hour, it feels like there's some new show of how this is being reacted to, unlike any humanitarian crisis that I have witnessed, um, and maybe the closest analog is Saddam Hussein's invasion of, of Kuwait, um, uh, which I think is an analogy others have drawn. But why do I mention this uh, sort of show of unity and solidarity with Ukraine in response to the question that you just posed? Because basically we need the entire world to stand for access in a way that on Ethiopia Tigray, maybe some countries have rhetorically, but you know, just really haven't put much behind it in, in many cases. And that has been a real impediment to getting food to, to, to Tigray, for example, um, in the way that in Syria, uh, some countries did, we certainly did, U European countries did, but you had Russia and China, you know, not, of course, uh, you know, not lending their voices. China could have a critical role to play in pressing on the humanitarian front, um, but so could many of the African countries, uh, either those that, again, uh, voted to denounce the invasion yesterday or those that didn't. And, and so, you know, this may sound very unsatisfying in that we need urgent operational progress, 
But, you know, because it is Russian troops that are encircling these towns and forcing civilians to, to be subjected to shelling and bombardment and food shortages and the, you know, the, the absence of, of insulin and other uh, critical medicines, it is the Russian Federation that will have to be pressed to open up access. And, and those negotiations will happen tactically, town by town, but there, there are also now already broad calls uh, for humanitarian pauses that I think are being heard around the world. Ambassador Power, I, I can't uh, underscore how important that is. It's not only we stand for access, we're going to have to demand access, and uh, we certainly hope that there is a pause. We know you are exceptionally busy and you've been very generous uh, with your, your reflections and your insights, but as you said, it is time to really turn this conversation to the voices from the region and their courage. And I'm therefore delighted to turn this now over uh, to my colleague, Jonathan Katz, Senior Fellow and Director of GMF's Democracy Initiatives and Co-Chair of our Transatlantic Task Force on Ukraine. Jonathan, thank you so much for your work. And I'm so grateful for our colleagues who are taking time to help us all understand uh, the importance of the situation and the importance of access and action. Over to you. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Administrator Power, uh, for, for laying out what, what's at stake and, and what the challenges are right now and the support that's needed. Um, I wanted to just bring in, uh, we have uh, Elena Prokopenko and Hannah Hopko, if you could uh, turn on, your, um, turn on your, uh, your, your video right now, as well as uh, USAID, uh, USAID Mission Director in Ukraine, Jim Hope. Um, I, I wanted to bring you in, and of course, GMF is proud to partner with USAID uh, for the last two decades. And, and this is, uh, there couldn't be a more important moment right now, uh, you know, to, to forge ahead. So I just wanted to bring in uh, voices from Ukraine and then also Jim Hope. Uh, I think many of you know Hannah Hopko. <clears throat> I've worked with Hannah for quite some time, including uh, post Euromaidan. Uh, she is a leading civil society activist, a former uh, chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Ukrainian Parliament. Um, Yana, this is a particularly challenging and difficult time for you, your family, your friends. Um, you heard what uh, the administrator said. Uh, we know the numbers. We know the support that Ukrainians are receiving when they cross the border the conditions for IDPs in the country, as well as those that are in the middle of urban warfare right now. So I wanted to just turn to you first, and then I'll introduce Elena and, and Jim Hope, uh, just following your, your opening, but maybe speak to, you know, after hearing the administrator in terms of what's needed right now for Ukrainians, both those that are um, in border countries, uh, in Moldova, in Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, um, things that you see happening right now. But also, um, I know that you are carefully watching, communicating, and speaking to those that are in Ukraine, in these cities, the administrator spoke about. What do you see as the key needs right now, and how best can we support Ukrainians, uh, both externally, uh, multilaterally, bilaterally? And I'm going to turn the floor to you, Hana, and then we'll, we'll, we'll ask Elena to turn on her, her video as well. So, Hana, over to you. Uh, excuse me, I prefer to keep my camera off if possible because I'm right at the Polish border and it's really extreme here. So if possible, I would like to yeah. keep it off for, for the time being. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anna. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, uh, Administrator Samantha Power. So uh, last time we met with you, it was 2015 in Kyiv when I chaired the, the Foreign Affairs Committee. So today I joined to this discussion because I truly believe that next time we meet, this will be key. And all international efforts now has to be just to protect my capital. Why it's important? Because 10 of my best friends now, they are sitting in Kyiv. They joined uh, territorial defense. They know that Russians troops trying to occupy Kyiv and to put in the siege from different directions. From the Russians, I'm in constant contact with them. Some of them joined to the evacuation team. One of my best friend this morning, he evacuated three newborn kids and they used buses. 
And when they saw the line of mothers with young kids and newborn kids, and there is no like places to evacuate to safer place in Ukraine. So this reminds me like, like Aleppo, uh, like, uh, uh, I don't know, even Grozny. So this is, I can't believe that this is my, my capital, the capital of Ukraine. Also within our civil society organization, just last December, we conducted the youth model of NATO parliamentary assembly. 250 students with Euro-Atlantic identity, they gathered in Kiev. So we were preparing the, the, uh, the to historic assembly of which is set up for this May. Do you know what the students are asking us, us now from Kharkiv? They just ask my team, Hanna, Ostap, Oleg, could you send us some money and food? Because we, for last week, we were sitting in shelters. We don't have, we, we just have bread. So this is like last three days, all my team is working, sending money and saying God that banks are still working in Ukraine. So providing food and others. So I also belong to the uh, uh, Board of Trustees of Children National Hospital, Okhmadid. This is one of the biggest children hospital in Ukraine. So now we are working how to evacuate children with oncological diseases. And yesterday, one doctor was killed. So this is why the issue of green corridors and also ICRC and others. Ukrainian heroism, that we are really brave and courage, but we also would like to see this courage from international organizations, because now we have a real problem with food supply and all these green corridors. This is what we have to demand, especially after yesterday resolution of the UN. And according to this resolution, which was adopted, this is a historical moment, finally. Russia recognized as an aggressor state. This is what we demanded from 2014, from the first invasion of Ukraine. And now we're seeing full-scale war, escalation, bombing cities, not just Kharkiv. My best friend just left Bila Tserkva with two kids. So this is what we are now, because for us, each life, each person matters. So this is why we have to save lives. But of course, I try to be optimistic and I truly believe that we will meet in also world leaders because no flies over Ukraine. This is what is also needed to provide these green corridors to make an uh, organization like Red Cross and others to deliver all these foods. So also, I think after this resolution, it's important to establish an international tribunal to prosecute Putin for war crimes and crimes against humanity, because uh, 2,000 people already killed. And uh, of course, Russian laws are uh, uh, much bigger, but we made an appeal to Russian soldiers, to Russian mothers, to Belarusian mothers, to stop the aggressor and to start fighting with the dictator because this is not in the interest of Russian Federation. So this is why the tribunal against Putin and Putin's oligarchs. And I think see how uh, Putin and his uh, uh, inner circle be, uh, the, the people, representatives, how their children are being deported from London, from uh, Brussels, uh, from all Western capitals. They have to understand that the West taking serious actions. And what, what is really important now, because uh, uh, Putin wanted to occupy Kyiv within two days, he failed. And actually all this Russian operation, this full scale escalation was planned for two weeks. Yesterday, they prolonged it for another two weeks. This is why resources matters, the same like time. When we demand, give us jet fighters now, why it's needed? Because all cities which are bombed, civilians are killed. This is really important. And also, uh, please uh, provide defense missiles, javelins, secure communication, which is really important now for us. 
so we uh, and our army with territorial defense, they are really very strong, but they need to receive more and the faster we receive ammunition and also jets, everything. This will help us to destroy all plans of Putin, because this is not just about uh, protecting Ukraine, protecting democracy. This is also about avoiding uh, nuclear war attacks on Warsaw, on Bucharest and others. This will not stop Putin. And uh, as soon as Russian oligarchs will understand that they will never uh, enjoy the luxury of Western civilization and their children are being deported, this might also create a pressure to Putin and he uh, 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 providing maximum military assistance, yeah. no-fly zone, uh, uh, green corridors to save lives, to help with uh, evacuation, food supply, which is really important. Also, uh, strengthening sanctions against Putin and oligarch uh, oligarchic families, which is really property confiscation, which is really important now for Ukraine to know uh, how we will rebuild our country. We have to also have this bigger vision and this is what we are doing now in Warsaw with my friends. I came here yesterday to organize this work to improve coordination and to uh, work within the International Center for Ukrainian Victory. This is because there are many uh, uh, requests and I'm very thankful to the foreigners who already joined and who is planning to join the International League that our president and to help, uh, to help Ukrainians. And I think also it's important to develop the agenda of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's post-war rebuilding infrastructure. This is what we were advocating during my service as the head of the Foreign Affairs Committee, so-called Marshall Plan for Ukraine. Because it's really important to, to also to send messages that Ukraine is winning now. The price we are paying makes me cry. But actually, without victory of Ukraine, the whole Western civilization and European continent will not be saved. And actually, if Putin will see that the West is uh, not fast supporting us, then China will behave like, like Putin, because this is too against all, against democracy, against peace. So I really uh, asking you to unite in Romania, in Bulgaria, in Poland, there's uh, fighter jets. This is what we need. We have professional pilots. We need to protect Ukraine from the air. And actually, air defense and anti-missile system, this is what is needed. And also, it's important to provide resources from ammunition to food, medicine, and, tre and uh, treatment. And also, uh, just, just to, to finish, uh, psychological support is also needed. Uh, um, many people already just uh, because it's more than a week of uh, pressure of reading different news, losing the loved one, the loved one. So this is why I think it's really the more we see support. And today, when I send a picture of uh, support moving from Warsaw, people are saying, "Hannah, thanks. This is a positive signal. It's it's like a, a light in the end of tunnel." So Uh, this is no fly zone over Ukraine, green corridors, uh, maximum military assistance, because this is the marathon. We uh, want this uh, uh, one week of battle. Putin also wants to destroy the identity and culture uh, uh, different places, like museums with the most uh, world-known famous painters of Ukraine. And Babin Yar bombed by Russia 80 years uh, after Nazi massacre uh, of Ukrainian Jews. So we wanted to explain that Putin behaves like Stalin, like Hitler, and we have, have to stop him and actually victory of Ukraine will uh, protect Western civilization and actually uh, newborn kids during bombing. This is about lives. For me, it's very... Uh, 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 it's it's important to, to support my friends who are now in Kiev and also with kids.
But actually, what I would like to say, life matters for us. I had to uh, leave my daughter and I also have to leave guinea pig, which my daughter loves enough. So we protected, we evacuated even our pets, even animals. So life matters for us compared to Russians, which just, and Putin just want to kill people. So this is why Samantha Parr, I can't really ask you, the US as a, one of the security guarantor of Ukraine together with the EU, e, UK, please mobilize all resources and also talk to your government. We know that you are doing, uh, trying to support us a lot, but now it's important so our army is ready to defend ourselves. We have enough courage. We just need more support and faster support because it's about saving lives. Hannah, thank you. Um, and, and we hear you and the world hears you and we hear the Ukrainian people. And I know that, that the administrator and everyone is working overtime to, you know, to provide that support. And I know how difficult this is for you even to, to, to talk about given what's taken place. And I appreciate you pointing out both the, both the short-term needs right now, the longer-term needs, um, and also the, the threats. And I, I share your concerns about code language like denazification as, as a code word for committing atrocities. Um, so I think we're, 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 we're clearly, we hear you. I want to bring in um, Elena Prokopenko, who's a visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund, uh, and focuses on U.S.-Ukraine relations, U.S.-EU. She is also co-founder, co along with myself, of the Transatlantic Task Force on Ukraine. Um, Elena, I know that you that you can't join by by video, and I know you're on the Ukrainian side of of the border with Poland. And you, you heard what you heard what Hanna said. Uh, you know, incredibly powerful, um, and the images that we are all seeing are are, you know, sort of match what Hannah said. Can you, can you also just, what, both what you're seeing, you, I know you're on the, uh, on the, um, on that border, what you're seeing right now, but also I know you've been thinking deeply about the needs as well. Um, and particularly um, that even as we're providing humanitarian assistance through other needs as well, and, and including support for civil society, support for free media, countering disinformation, um, but the, the immediate humanitarian needs are, are incredibly um, are, are needed right now. But can you speak to what you're seeing and what you see as the needs? Over to you, Elena. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, well, uh, I'm uh, like Jonathan Test said, I'm at the Polish border right now in pretty extreme conditions. So, uh, yeah, we're trying to evacuate to Warsaw with my parents and grandparents in, of the age of 60 to 93. We spent um, the last several days in bomb shelters and slept on the floor of uh, metro stations and basements and and then we fled to Kiev suburbs hoping that it would be uh, safer there but um, two days later we woke up to the sounds of the aircrafts flying right over our house which was a hell of an alarm clock I must say and um, we found ourselves four miles from the front lines and with an acute shortage of food supplies in the stores. Um, and now, like hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, we're fleeing to Poland and leaving, uh, leaving our um, entire life here and um, that, that we have been working so hard for um, with only a glimpse of hope that we can return in any foreseeable future. Um, uh, the, the, horizon, the horizon of planning for us has shrinked from months to hours, and I think every Ukrainian can, 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 can say that and can, can second that right now. Uh, we've never really been able to plan years ahead living in Ukraine, but now it's literally hours. Um, in the past week, I've been receiving multiple media requests to comment on the uh, Russian war in Ukraine. And when I was asked if I could be interviewed in a few hours, I, I, I would catch myself thinking that it's an eternity away. It's, 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 it's really, I, I know nothing about where I'm going to be in, in a few hours or, or whether I'm even going to be alive and well. And, and that's, that's the pain of every Ukrainian right now. Um, another uh, heartbreaking aspect of this war that has been um, already um, uh, addressed by, by uh, previous speakers is that it separates families for an indefinite time. And um, um, as you know, men of uh, 
I'm sorry, <laughs> men of 18 to 60 are uh, restricted from leaving Ukraine due to possible further mobilization and women and children are fleeing abroad for safety and the social consequences of this separation are mm, yet to be discovered really. Um, I, I can uh, I can say that um, one week in a war zone and we're um, already uh, deeply traumatized and uh, um, no one knows how long it will take for um, every Ukrainian to recover psychologically um, from that and feel again that there is anything to look forward to ahead of us. Uh, but uh, despite the, the heartbreak and the terror of this crisis, Ukrainians are as united as ever and millions of us are uh, looking really hard for the role we can personally play in uh, helping Ukraine to resist this Russian invasion and in nearing Ukraine's victory. Uh, we can see that uh, negotiations uh, between Ukraine and Russia do not seem to promise any breakthrough in the coming weeks um, from what we have seen in the previous rounds. And I'm worried that uh, we may be heading into the repetition of the Donbass peace talks that have uh, gradually turned into a total formality over this past four years since the Russian invasion. Uh, uh, despite unprecedented unity and severity of the Western sanctions that we've seen, they are still too weak and too slow to deter Russian invasion. And these sanctions would have been adequate and proportional in 2014, as Hannah already said, when Russia annexed the Crimea and occupied um, the part of Donbass. Uh, but today the response should be significantly stronger and faster. Today the world is um, astonished by the uh, incredible courage of the Ukrainian army, our civilian defense and citizens of the Ukrainian citizen towns who are literally uh, stopping, stopping Russian troops and tanks with their bare hands, with their bodies. Um, but today, um, yeah, it's, it's important not to dwell on this admiration alone and be very um, pragmatic and very practical about supporting Ukraine on the level of state and level of NGOs, um, diaspora organizations, um, individual citizens and um in addition to what um, anna has already hannah has already said um, i'd like to reiterate uh, the urgent needs that we have been uh, voicing and circulating for the past several weeks now what we need from foreign partners it's again introducing a no-fly zone over ukraine to minimize civilian casualties which again have already been more than 2,000. Uh, we need enhancing military assistance to Ukraine, including modern weapons and equipment. Uh, we need uh, excluding Russia from all international organizations and alliances, cutting off diplomatic ties with Russia, disconnecting from SWIFT completely, uh, introducing trade embargo with Russia, freezing assets uh, of the Russian government, oligarchs and their families abroad. We need banning their entry to Western countries and exp expelling those of them who already are in the West, we need their children to be expelled from the Western schools and universities and deporting them. We need them to be deported back to uh, Russia. Uh, we also need simplifying entry for Ukrainian refugees and, and helping them access protection as soon as possible. Um, and of course, Ukraine uh, needs financial and humanitarian assistance that Hanna has already uh, emphasized as well as other uh, speakers um, and uh, on the civil society side the the most uh, uh, crucial support is now needed by human rights organizations and volunteers who are monitoring war crimes that Russia has been committing and who are monitoring numerous uh, uh, human rights violations and who are coordinating uh, humanitarian assistance to the most vulnerable groups and, and areas in Ukraine that already uh, have uh, shortages uh, of, of food and other critical supplies. Uh, and uh, we, of course, need your support uh, for uh, Ukraine's um, application to become a member of the European Union because we believe that Ukraine is the, has, has definitely um, demonstrated that it's a very that it's a reliable partner and its its European integration uh, vector is is um, um, unwavering. Uh, I also wanted to briefly touch upon uh, the so-called uh, issue of the liquidation or kill list that um, we um, have, have uh, uh, read about, the, the list that have reportedly been uh, compiled by the Russian authorities and uh, can be uh, went after the people who can be, who can be persecuted if, if Russia uh, takes over. Uh, if, even those of us who are not in those lists are not safe, cannot be safe um, right now because uh, 
a basic Google search of what we have been doing would demonstrate that uh, which ones of us have been uh, supporting Ukraine's uh, European and Euro-Atlantic integration and, and who are there for uh, Russia's uh, enemies. And, and I, I really encourage our international partners to do whatever they can to uh, uh, to, to identify who are on those lists and to uh, to to, to uh, evacuate Ukrainians who who can be uh, who can be endangered. Uh, the, the, the global discussion of this war uh, and the humanitarian crisis that Ukraine is facing is lacking Ukrainian voices and the stories of those who are personally affected. But uh, these voices are still there, and I hope we we are heard. I hope we will be heard. Ukraine is uh, really at the front lines of the global democracy. It's not about Ukraine uh, alone right now. And we need a stronger uh, Western support to protect uh, not only Ukrainian, but also uh, global security. Uh, we all understand probably that if Putin is not uh, stopped now, the war will likely knock on the doors of our neighbors and make sure that uh, there are no safe places left in Europe and possibly the world. Um, sanctions are, of course, costly and painful, and we understand why the West is hesitant to, to strengthen them. But it's much more costlier, and it's going to be much more painful to rebuild Ukraine and to restore global order if, it, uh, if we don't take decisive steps right now. Uh, we have had enough experience with Russia to know that our enemy uh, doesn't speak or understand the language of diplomacy. Uh, the only language it does understand is the language of force. We need you to provide Ukraine with greater amounts of modern lethal weapons and military equipment. Uh, we ask you to equip Ukraine to win. Um, Russia is a terrorist state and should be treated as one. Uh, we do hope for your further support and we hope that it comes as fast as possible. Thank you. Well, Elena, thank you. Um, I, I may just do a little bit of a, uh, uh, just to, you know, Jim, if you can hold on one second, just uh, to the administrator. I know you've you've dealt with and, and have seen similar type of war situations. And, and I just want to get a sense of listening to them, sort of your response, you know, uh, when you hear this type of plea for support and, and what you're thinking um, and what can we say to the Ukrainian people? Um. Well, I got my my Kleenex here that I've been making great use of uh, in the last week. So I, I guess that's what I say first and foremost is that, you know, this is real. This is our hearts are breaking for you. But the second thing I say is I got to get off this call and go back to work. <laughs> you know, like, uh, so, you know, everything they're saying um, you know, uh, just is what's animating the world. And I, I, I very much take the point about Ukrainian voices needing to be more at center stage. And this is scant consolation, but it, the things that have happened, which are not sufficient and have not stopped Putin to be clear, but every one of the things that has happened have happened because of Ukrainian voices. And, and, you know, you've read or heard about President Zelensky and his transformation of the European appetite, you know, um, the, the, what independent media is and, and what individual citizens are sharing on their cell phones has done as much to shape global opinion as any UN General Assembly, <laughs> you know, session of speeches and, and so forth. So, you know, keep, I mean, there's nothing to say, really, Jonathan. I mean, it's it's just that on the substance, um, you know, with the, I think what's important about the announcement that that was previewed here earlier in the in the session is we're asking for ten billion dollars uh, up on on Capitol Hill, and we have to translate that quickly into security assistance, humanitarian assistance, um, more sanctions, and we again are are under. You know, I, I, you can expect more tightening every day, not just by us, but by by all actors. But I think again, what what we're hearing is the humanitarian needs and the pain is now, and and that's why the discussion we had earlier about access, about getting in the in the same way that Hannah has been doing, is hustling to get food and medicine into people who are in basements. I. I she made a, a, a point 
earlier as well about international organizations and needing them to show to show courage. Uh, they are coming in, they are scaling up, they are ramping up for sure. A challenge though, is that who, who, who is the animating, um, who, who are the agents of change inside Ukraine uh, across the board, Ukrainians, right? And so the, you know, well, it is very, very challenging to ask of our Ukrainian brothers and sisters who are in bomb shelters here, help us with the dispersal of, of you know, food assistance or, or medical assistance. So we are working with them as much as we can, but we don't want to put them in extra danger, but also trying to work um, with other actors, you know, who can be part of the same kinds of people that Hannah's working with and, and others who have made it outside or are doing such important work with. Um, but I'm on the phone 24 seven with Ukrainian government officials to try to figure out, you know, where is the best crossing point? Where are the vulnerabilities? And we're, you know, uh, going to push uh, and get the entire world to push for access, even as, as this conflict persists. And I'm not the person to talk about security assistance and the other very specific proposals that have been made. But, um, but as you know, uh, you know, there, that, that is, uh, we, we are in a place today in terms of the provision of, of military assistance that goes well beyond um, probably even 48 hours ago, uh, what, what people had contemplated. So, so that assistance will flow, and we know that the the will of the Ukrainian people to resist is um, is uh, o overpowering. But we also see the overwhelming force positioned against you, and and need the people around Putin to see the consequences for the Russian people along the lines of what our two Ukrainian speakers have have discussed see those consequences getting more and more severe every day as they are uh, and do what is required to end this war. Yeah, and, and, and we, we want you to get back oh, to just, oh, Hannah. Yeah, but, but I think Jonathan, it's very important what Samantha Parr said because during uh, when I was speaking, I received a message from my friend who is in Kiev and he sent me like, Hannah, we just fight with Kadyrov, Kadyrov uh guys so this is really very dangerous they are in town and he asked me like kana if something happens with me please promise that you will take care of my wife and daughter and i sent him a message that please you will win and you will kill this kadiros guy so please but uh, what i'm thinking now we have also besides recovery of economy we also have to establish a special fund for these heroes who already died fighting with Russian soldiers. They are families, so we promised, like our friends, that we will take care of their uh, uh, wives and children, but also, I think, international. And already left Ukraine, and they are smart. Maybe we could organize some internships like for students working in different institutions, in Bratislava, in Warsaw, in Washington, just they continue these connections and having access to different institutions like parliaments, uh, Congress and others. So they are not just on the streets or some uh, refugees uh, centers. They need to feel, uh, and also psychologically, that they are joining to some institutions, civil society, and to build this network for those who, who already leave Ukraine. To, to support them and those who are coming to defend also we will have in resources we will um, guarantee that this is the case definitely we will win and we, we we hear you and i i know that there's you know a lot that's happening i would urge congress once that supplemental assent to to move that as quickly as possible to get those get those resources out um and that's you know, and, and, you know, plus up as much as possible that funding level for all the things that are needed and are going to be needed. Jim, uh, Jim Hope, I want to bring you in as, as the USAID mission director in, in Ukraine. Uh, you, I know that you and your colleagues have had to shift very quickly, uh, but, you know, have the U.S. government has been long engaged for the last three decades uh, in support of Ukrainians, transformation, democracy, multiple sectors. I just wanted to talk, just bring you in to see how you're transitioning when you hear Hanna and Elena speak about what the needs are, um, I know you're you, you're on, uh, on on the other side of the border right now. Can you just speak to how you're transitioning your priorities? And they mentioned there's a number of really um, immediate needs, 
um, some things that are lurking, um, including it challenges of issues of, of addressing human rights violations and documentation to, uh, to the potential for energy and other security needs, uh, cyber as well, countering disinformation, uh, which has been a major, you know, uh, the administrator mentioned or somebody mentioned the voices around the globe that we're all fighting disinformation. We're, we're, we're with you, Ukraine. Uh, but do you speak to some of the things that how you're transitioning uh, USAID, even within the projects that you have? Thank you, Jim. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Jonathan. And uh, thank you, Administrator Power. And and thank you, Hannah and Elena. It's it's emotional and very, it's a privilege and honor really to, to be on a panel with you. You represent the strength uh, and the bravery of the Ukrainian people. Uh, and we hear you uh, loud and clear. Um, my name is Jim Hope. I'm the USAID Director in Ukraine. It was in Kyiv and now temporarily relocated across the border here in Poland, uh, not far uh, here in Jeshuv, Poland, uh, here with a core embassy uh, team. Uh, and we are focused 24-7 on responding to all of the different needs uh, that we've been talking about today and that are emerging each and every day. And maybe that's a place to start, is just that we stand by Ukraine. Uh, with every Ukrainian in Kyiv, in Mariupol, in Kharkiv, everywhere, and with everyone who is suffering, uh, in shelters, on at the borders, in cars, by foot, uh, and those fighting uh, on the streets to defend Ukraine's independence and freedom. Administrator Power mentioned the humanitarian aspect and the massive uh, response that's coming on the humanitarian side uh, and to respond to urgent and life and death needs. But at the same time, because we've had a 30-year relationship partnership on development uh, with Ukraine since independence, we're focusing on rapidly and quickly redirecting the set of development programs uh, that, are, that are currently operating in country. Uh, these are programs that focused on supporting Ukraine's reform process, its anti-corruption work, its work on human rights, energy security, health services, democratic institution buildings. These are all the platform now uh, to try to respond uh, to today's needs uh, and to, to prepare the ground for post-war, post-victory. Uh, work that's going to be needed. So just to give a couple of examples, we're helping with the government uh, on countering cyber attacks, both diagnosing and dealing with those that are coming in, but also preparing and defending against ones that are coming uh, and that continue to come. Uh, we're working with the Ministry of Energy uh, and all the different elements in the energy sector to try to keep the gas, the power, the electricity flowing as much as possible. So for example, work using re providing remote imagery uh, with the transmission operators to give visibility on damages uh, around the country on transmission lines or communications equipment, uh, satellite phones, so that people can stay in touch during this crisis. Uh, in the lead up to the conflict that broke, up, broke out last week, uh, we were working and pivoted to support local governments at the, particularly in the East and the South uh, on emergency preparedness, on providing equipment, on telecommunications work, on providing basic information to communities, uh, and very practical things like first responder uh, kits uh, or setting up transportation services, which are all tragically and sadly being used right now uh, in places like Kramatorsk and Severodonetsk and Kherson uh, uh, across uh, the eastern and southern flank. We've also been, of course, helping with the government and civil society and media to put out credible Ukrainian information uh, to counter this massive uh, amount of Russian disinformation and false, false flag narratives that are out there every single day, every single minute, really, uh, on social media. Uh, so that's both on the response side within civil society, media, government, but also uh, with uh, citizens to help them filter filter the news that they're receiving so that they can be confident in the sources of information that they're getting from uh, their government or from their civil society uh, partners. Uh, we're also pivoting to provide uh, vulnerable populations the medicines that they need of HIV patients, uh, people with tuberculosis, uh, 
trying to keep those stocks uh, in place uh, uh, during this conflict and crisis. We are going to continue to pivot, to continue to adapt. Uh, that's what I'm doing here with the team uh, in Jeshuf, uh, to use our ongoing platforms, our ongoing programs, our ongoing relationships uh, with Ukrainians throughout the country to respond to, to the challenges that are emerging, and many of which were mentioned already. And finally, I just want to say, you know, the heart and soul of USAID's work, its partnership with Ukraine is, is really the Ukrainian people. Uh, the staff that work at USAID, the over thousand Ukrainians who implement USAID funded programs throughout the country, they are continuing to fight the fight literally, but also on the development side throughout the country. Uh, we're in constant touch. Uh, there is not a more dedicated and courageous group of people uh, than these partners out there in civil society, on human rights, in local governments and national governments who are working in the middle of this terrible crisis to make things better, to meet needs of their fellow citizens. So in this in uncertain and really dangerous time, I think one thing is clear and, and, I, and we want it to come through very loud and clear is that USAID is going to continue to stand together uh, with Ukraine and with its people uh, now and in a post-victory, post-war situation. Thank you. Jim, thank you for, for walking us through all these things and we don't have enough time to, to get through all the work, important work that's being done to support Ukrainian people. We have about two minutes left. And then what I wanted to just maybe do quickly, if it's okay with everybody, uh, one is just to give uh, just, you know, sort of 30 seconds each to, to Hannah and Olena, um, just to maybe to close us out. Um, and then also just, you know, administrate, if you want 30 seconds, I can maybe end with you if that's okay. But Hannah, uh, Hannah and Olena, Hannah, let me send it over to you for just 30 seconds and thank you. And I wish we had even more time to talk, but I think your message was loud and clear. We heard it. We're here. We're going to help. So Hannah, over to you. Thank you so much. So Ukraine with more than 1000 years of history and St. Sophia Cathedral in Kiev, this has approved that Ukraine from Kiev Rus time and actually nobody could destroy our dream our dream just to be free sovereign nation and actually to make another nations which are now suffering from dictators also to make them free. So victory of Ukraine matters for everybody, for Uyghurs, which are now also under the repression in China, for people, indigenous people living at the territory of Russian Federation, Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, Idel Ural and others. So our victory matters for people who really wants to be free because Ukraine it's about liberty, freedom, independence, independence and democracy. This is basically looking into the future. This is why we are like demanding, requesting, asking you to be with us now because this is about a joint common victory for the future of the uh, Western civilization. And as a newborn child, which were just born in Ukraine, the same new civilization, new, uh, 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 without double uh, standards, without hybrid diplomacy, civilization is being born in Ukraine. So this is why I'm kind of asked to protect Ukraine now because it's important to save lives. I know the price already makes me cry, but we have to be strong. We have to support those who are suffering and send positive signal. Ukraine is winning. The victory is coming. So thank you for helping us. I explained what we need. We have operational plan. We have strategic vision. We have uh, institutional, uh, strong institutions. And the most we have, we have love and people who loves Ukraine and who is ready to sacrifice lives for victory, which will come. Thank you, Elena. Uh, just quick, just a quick twenty seconds, and I apologize. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you, everyone, for listening and for joining us. And uh, I would like to encourage everyone of you who are with us today to.
to think very clearly and closely about what you personally can do uh, to help Ukraine. And I'm sure there's a lot you can do. And we will uh, do our best to share the resources and links and 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 uh, banking details of of the uh, uh, organizations that are receiving help to the for the Ukrainian army. Uh, we are determined to win. We know we will win. But with your help, with your urgent and proportional help, we will not have to pay as immense a price as we are paying already. Thank you very much. Elena, please be safe. Please be safe. Um, Thank you so much. Administrative power, just I know you have to leave and we're sorry to keep you 10 seconds over time. So we'll no, give you just, the final word. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just would thank uh, Hannah and Elena above all uh, for saying everything that needs to be said. And Hannah, you, you started your, your comments a while ago saying, you know, when we last met was in was in Kiev and and I think what I said to you then is what I will say to you and, and your brothers and sisters now, which is just, we are with you through thick and thin. I think I said it then, but I didn't imagine this. I will, I will say this, is, uh, this goes well beyond um, uh, a level of, of, of brutality and aggression um, and paranoia uh, than anything, I, I think, back then uh, that, that we anticipated, even having seen the Donbass and, and Crimea. Uh, brutally seized. Um, but we are with you. We are listening to you. Uh, we are working 24-7 to support you. And it is your voices who need to dictate this response. And so just know uh, uh, all of us, again, stand with you and stand ready to adapt as we seek from our side, just as the USAID side and, and the State Department. So uh, our, our piece of this is how do we meet the humanitarian needs of people under siege right now, the people that you, whose, whose voices you have elevated in this, in this venue. So we will not give up until we find a way to get food and medicine in and to get civilians uh, moving out. And, and the pressure needs to, to grow uh, even more uh, than it has up to this point. Last thing I'd say, Jonathan, because a number of people, I think Elena put it beautifully, which is what can everyone who's here do? There's so many people who care and we see that in the frontline states, again, with the welcomes they are offering. But from afar, it can feel a little more removed. So we have created uh, at USAID a website, which is CIDI.org, and it just lists a number of the organizations uh, when it comes to the humanitarian side of things uh, that you can support. And we will also uh, look to make available the list of organizations like those Hannah and Elena um, you know, have worked with over the years uh, so you can support these local actors who are really uh, driving, who are, the, who are the heart and soul of this entire effort. So thank you so much. Administrator, Administrator Power, thank you so much. And thank you to Jim, to our friends, Hannah and Elena, we're with you, um, you know, and we'll continue our push to, you know, to support, you know, you, Ukrainian people. Um, and I also want to just point out the, the work, obviously, of USAID, um, and USAID colleagues who are working around the clock to, to support to support you and also uh, with the understanding of how this situation is transitioning right now. And obviously the, the Biden administration and President Biden too, who keep pushing as hard as possible to provide that support. So on behalf of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, also our, our partners, RPR, uh, in Kiev, um, and and my co-chair, my TTFU co-chair, Elena Prokopenko, we're going to keep working. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, and also, uh, Elena, again, be safe, and and all of our best. Stand with Ukraine. Thank you.